quick, what are the colors of the rainbow? Easy mnemonic, if you're unsure, just remember the name Roy G. Biv, representing the seven colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. But have you ever wondered why the rainbow has seven colors? After all, the visible color spectrum is just that, a spectrum encompassing a continuous range of wavelengths from 380 nanometers at the red end to 700 nanometers at the violet. Even stranger, one of the standard seven colors isn't quite like the others. We are of course talking about indigo. Sandwiched in between blue and violet, indigo is neither fish nor fowl, being variously reported as either a deeper blue, a lighter purple, or some mixture of the two, and when presented with an actual rainbow, many people can't even perceive indigo as a distinct color. Unsurprisingly then, that many popular depictions of rainbows, including the original Apple computer logo, the pride flag, and the iconic prism artwork from Pink Floyd's 1973 album, The Dark Side of the Moon, have opted to ditch the hue altogether, opting for a simpler and more intuitive slate of six colors because the individuals behind these monstrosity so-called rainbows are clearly colorist. For shame. So why was indigo ever included in the first place? As with so many standardized facts taught to us in school, the answer lies in the arbitrary and idiosyncratic choices of a single person, in this case legendary 17th century scientist and apple hater Sir Isaac Newton. This is the strange and mystical story of how indigo ended up on the rainbow. Prior to the work of Newton, the most widely accepted theory of color was that developed by ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. In his treatise on sense and what is sensed, written around 330 BC, Aristotle posited that all colors are composed of varying mixtures of lightness and darkness, and arranged the five known chromatic colors, red, yellow, blue, green, and purple, on a linear scale extending from yellow on the light end to blue on the dark end. He also linked the colors to the four fundamental elements, arguing that earth, air, and water were naturally white and fire yellow, and that the former acquire color through interactions with varying levels of light and darkness. This model remained largely unchanged for more than 2,000 years because humans were stupid. However, consistent with this, Aristotle's theories offered no concrete logic for which colors corresponded to which proportions of white and black. The precise number and order of colors in his linear scale was open to interpretation. Indeed, while Aristotle's original scale went yellow, red, purple, green, blue, a version recorded in 325 AD by Roman philosopher Chalcidius included only three primary colors, yellow, red, and blue in that order. In the 14th century, French Franciscan monk Bartholomus Anglicus proposed a color scale of yellow, orange, red, purple, green, while in the early 1500s, Renaissance man extraordinaire Leonardo da Vinci used the order yellow, green, blue, red, moving red from its traditional central position to the dark end of the spectrum where all naughty colors belong. Given this ambiguity, it was clear that a more rigorous and comprehensive theory of color was needed, Enter Sir Isaac Newton. In 1665, London was struck by the Great Plague, the last major outbreak of the bubonic plague in the British Isles. The epidemic killed nearly 100,000 people, forcing many institutions, including universities, to shut their doors. Newton, then a 23-year-old student at Trinity College at the University of Cambridge, was sent home and spent the following year at his family's estate in Woolsthorpe, Lincolnshire. While Newton had been an unexceptional student at Cambridge, the following 18 months proved extraordinarily productive. Seeing Newton develop the rudiments of calculus and make major breakthroughs in theories of optics and gravitation, which, fun story, is remarkably similar to my achievements during COVID lockdown, which, among other advancements, with regards to biology, included an extensive Extensive, many months long sample size study on how much squeezy cheese one human can intake in a 24 hour period without dying. Going back to Newton, perhaps the most famous experiments Newton conducted during this period involved using glass prisms to investigate the nature of light and color. At the time, there was a considerable debate regarding the source of colors produced by prisms. Did the prism somehow add these colors to the beam and light as it passed through, or were the colors an intrinsic property of the light itself, which the prism separated out? In his experiments, Newton cut a small hole in a window shutter, allowing a beam of light to enter a darkened room, and then placed a prism into the beam, projecting the resulting light spectrum onto a screen. By changing the shape of the hole and the angle of the prism, Newton discovered that no matter the shape of the light beam, the color spectrum produced by the prism was always dispersive or fan-shaped. 
Furthermore, he found that no matter how many times any of the colored bands in the spectrum was passed through a set of prisms, it could not be broken down further. It remained the same color. Finally, by passing the spectrum through a lens and another prism, Newton was able to recombine the colors into a single beam of white light. Based on these results, Newton concluded that white light was not a pure entity as previously believed, but rather a mixture of every other color, and that the prisms separated out these colors by bending or refracting each one at a different angle. Furthermore, these experiments suggested that there was a physical basis for the specific order of the colors within the spectrum, obliterating the ambiguity inherent in the old Aristotelian model, proving yet again Aristotle was wrong about everything. In his 1704 masterwork, Optics, Newton illustrated this inherent order by rolling the linear color spectrum into a circle, creating the first modern color wheel. According to this model, there are three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, which can be combined to produce three secondary colors, green, orange, and purple. Today, of course, we know that this is not actually the case and that each color on the spectrum corresponds to a different wavelength of light. Nonetheless, Newton's trichromatic model remained highly influential for hundreds of years. Newton's color wheel allowed the results of mixing different colors to be predicted by placing a mark at any point within the circle and calculating the relative number of rays contributed by each segment of the wheel, a process similar to determining the center of gravity of an array of masses in physics. This model effectively pioneered the modern concept of hue and saturation for characterizing different colors, though it should be noted Newton did not use this exact language. The wheel also illustrated that colors opposite one another, the so-called complementary colors, cancel each other out to produce white light. They are also the colors which, when placed side by side, produce the greatest contrast. However, it's important to note that Newton's wheel only predicts the colors produced when mixing beams of light and is thus governed by additive color theory. By contrast, the mixing of paint, ink, and other substances which absorb, reflect, or filter light rather than transmit it follows different rules and is governed by the subtractive color theory. But while Newton's color wheel was very similar to those used today, there were two notable differences. First, while most modern color wheels are divided into equal segments, Newton's used segments of unequal size. And second, while Newton's trichromatic theory theoretically dictates six primary and secondary colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and purple, Newton added a seventh, indigo, between blue and violet. But why? Why did Newton break the elegant simplicity of his model by adding a seventh color? Well, you might think it was just that he got hopped up on barley wine and began wondering if the same color blue to you was the same color blue to him. In fact, the answer actually isn't that much better. Newton thought the number seven was more cosmically meaningful. While this may seem like a strangely arbitrary and unscientific decision for such a great mind, it's important to understand the very different state of science in Newton's day. While today we think of science and religion as having nothing to do with one another inherently, this was not the case in the 17th century. Religious and spiritual thought permeated every facet of life and intellectual thought, and the scientists or natural philosophers of the era saw their task as one of uncovering an underlying order and beauty in God's creation. As German astronomer Johannes Kepler, discoverer of the laws of planetary motion, explained, God manifests himself not only in the words of scriptures, but also in the wonderful arrangement of the universe and in its conformity with the human intellect. As a result, discussions with theology and natural philosophy often overlapped with many of the greatest intellects of the era, including Gottfried Leibniz, René Descartes, Blaise Pascal, and Francis Bacon performed extensive work in both the spiritual and scientific realm. Indeed, while remembered today as a rigorous mathematician and experimental scientist, Sir Isaac Newton was also an avid alchemist, spending a significant amount of his life searching for the fabled Philosopher's Stone, which would grant eternal life and convert basic metals into gold because sure, why not? He also wrote many works on theology, including a detailed analysis of biblical prophecies and tracts denying the Anglican doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Such views were radical for their time and could easily have gotten Newton branded a heretic. Indeed, when Newton was appointed Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge in 1669, his colleagues, fearing that his controversial beliefs would derail his academic career, hastily secured him an exemption from the traditional requirement that he be ordained into the Church of England. Newton's alchemical experiments were also conducted in secret as the practice was banned by the government, who feared that the ability to create gold would undermine the economy. 
Ironically, in 1699, Newton was appointed Master of the Royal Mint, a position he would hold until his death in 1727. Looks like someone managed to use science to create gold for himself after all. As a result of his more spiritual and occult pursuits, Newton believed in the harmony and interconnectedness of all creation, and it is for this reason that he divided the visible spectrum into seven rather than six colors. The number seven is seen as important and sacred in many cultures and appears again and again in Christian theology. God rested on the seventh day, or sometimes it's called the seventh event, after creating the universe. There are seven archangels in heaven. There are seven churches, seven seals, and seven trumpets in the book of Revelation, and seven Christian virtues, faith, hope, charity, prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude. By contrast, the number six was strongly associated with Satan. In addition, seven also showed up frequently in the natural world. For example, in Newton's day there were seven known classical planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, the Moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, as well as seven notes in the musical scale. Indeed, Newton's division of the color wheel into unequal segments was based on the notes of the western major scale, with the smallest segments, orange and indigo, standing in for semitones. Alright, so Newton chose seven colors because it fit better into his mystical, holistic view of the universe. But why indigo specifically? As previously mentioned, many people can't even distinguish indigo as a distinct color between blue and violet, while there are two other intermediate or tertiary colors Newton could just as easily have chosen, blue-green or turquoise, and orange-yellow. While Newton never wrote down his reason for choosing this particular hue, it may well have been a mere accident of history and 17th century global trade. The color indigo takes its name from Indigofera, a genus of plant which for centuries was the traditional source of the dark blue dye. While Indigofera comprises more than 750 species found around the world, the most commonly cultivated variety is Indigofera tinctoria, or true indigo thought to have originated in the Indus Valley in what is now India. Indeed, the word indigo comes from the Greek indikon, meaning dye from India. Traditionally, indigo dye was manufactured by crushing the plant's leaves and leaving them to ferment in water for a period of time. The resulting deep blue liquid was then drained, mixed with sodium hydroxide or lye, then packed into cakes and left to dry in the sun. The resulting powder varies in color, often appearing dark green, but reverts to a deep, vibrant blue when mixed down with water for dyeing cloth. The earliest evidence of indigo production comes from the Indus Valley civilization in the 2nd millennium BC, and by the 4th century BC, the dye had spread west across the Mediterranean, becoming a highly prized luxury good in both ancient Rome and Greece. Nonetheless, it was far cheaper than Tyrian or Imperial Purple, extracted from thousands of Murex sea snails, and so expensive it was reserved for the exclusive use of emperors and other high officials. Being an important product from the East, the source of indigo remained a mystery to Europeans until the 13th century when Venetian merchant Marco Polo, annoyed at people constantly calling out his name, returned from his travels across Asia with a description of the manufacturing process. At the end of the Middle Ages, the opening of trade routes with the East brought a flood of indigo, and by the time of Newton in the late 17th century, a flourishing trade had emerged in Britain and across its growing empire. The more colorfast Eastern pigment supplanting the traditional blue dye industry based on the plant Isasis tinctoria, better known as Wode. In 1744, American colonist Eliza Pinckney established the first North American indigo plantation in South Carolina, founding an industry whose profits quickly outstripped those of both cotton and sugar in the region. Indeed, by the time of the American Revolution in the 1770s, indigo cakes as a currency had greater purchasing power than the dollar and were used directly to purchase slaves from Africa, because the past was the worst, and arms and other supplies for the rebels, because rebels need to rebel, it's literally in the name. Used in all kinds of products, including artist paints and blue jeans, first introduced in the 1870s by Levi Strauss, natural indigo remained a value commodity until 1901, when German chemist Johannes Flager discovered a method for inexpensively synthesizing the dye. The introduction of cheap synthetic indigo caused the traditional indigo market to collapse, especially in India, where manufacturers and dyers, having suddenly lost their only source of income, faced mass poverty and starvation. All because Johannes Flegger's parents encouraged him to study chemistry. I hope they're happy with what their pigment-loving son became. So when choosing a seventh color to fill out his color wheel, Newton likely chose indigo simply because it was familiar to him, especially living in Lincolnshire where blue wood dye was traditionally cultivated. 
Yet despite Newton's enormous standing in the world of natural philosophy, not everyone agreed with his more scientific take on color theory. Among Newton's greatest critics were his contemporary and bitter enemy Robert Hooke and 19th century German polymath Johannes von Goethe, who in his 1810 book Theory of Colors argued that the perception of colors varied subjectively from viewer to viewer and could not be accurately modeled mathematically. Though mostly remembered today largely as a poet and novelist, Goth considered theory of colors to be among his greatest accomplishments. But while Newton was largely proven correct in his mathematical interpretation of the color spectrum, Goth may have had a point for numerous factors, including lighting conditions, the presence of other colors, and the subjectivity of the viewer can indeed greatly affect the perception of a given color. One example of this is in the so-called Abney effect, discovered in 1910 by English chemist and physicist Sir William Abney. This describes a phenomenon whereby adding increasing amounts of white light to a particular color causes a shift in its perceived hue, such that blue seems to shift towards violet, red towards magenta, and green towards cyan. Another is the infamous dress viral phenomenon from 2015 where the ambiguity produced by differing light conditions caused people to variously perceive a photograph of a dress as being either blue and black or white and gold. And to think that was the most heated and divisive thing people on the internet had to argue about humans. The extreme subjectivity of color perception has led some modern experts to speculate that the colors in Newton's original spectrum may actually have been slightly different than the ones normally depicted today. As color theorists, which apparently is a thing, Gary Waldman explains, a careful reading of Newton's work indicates that the color he called indigo we would normally call blue. His blue is then what we would name blue-green or cyan. You're not fooling anyone, Gary Walden. We all know you simply got baked and are now trying to say in a more smart sounding way with your fancy color theorist title, no less, how do I know the same color blue to Newton is the same color blue to me? But going back to Waldman's totally not drug-induced supposition, this makes sense given that the color of both natural and synthetic indigo are far closer to blue than the purplish hue typically depicted in the visible light spectra, with what is now commonly referred to as indigo being closer to the color of another traditional deep blue pigment, lapis lazuli or ultramarine. This means that the seventh color that Newton added to fit his semi-mystical model of the universe may not have been indigo at all, but rather cyan. As for today, the colors of the visible light spectrum are defined by their wavelengths, though where each color begins and ends is still a matter of subjective interpretation and no doubt keeps color theorists up at night. Indeed, the spectrum encompasses a near infinite continuous range of wavelengths with the entire idea of there being six or seven main colors deriving from our brain's tendency to break up information into smaller, more manageable units, a process elegantly known as chunking. For the sake of convenience, however, agencies like the US National Bureau of Standards define the red band of the spectrum as extending from 700 to 600 nanometers, orange from 600 to 580 nanometers, yellow from 580 to 550 nanometers, green from 550 to 500 nanometers, blue from 550 to 450 nanometers, and violet from 450 to 400 nanometers. Meanwhile, what is commonly described as indigo extends from 420 to 450 nanometers. This translates to a wavelength range of 20 nanometers, meaning that while the indigo band is often criticized as an arbitrary addition too small to count as its own separate color, it is in fact equal in size to the universally recognized yellow band. Take that, yellow truthers. Today, the jury remains firmly out on the indigo question. While many current depictions of the color spectrum retain the controversial hues, others replace it with the more easily discernible cyan, while still others, as well as most artistic renditions of the rainbow, eliminate the seventh color altogether, subtly demonstrating their colorist biases and returning to a more manageable red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet as God intended. But whatever version of the rainbow you prefer, the story of indigo's controversial inclusion, like the persistence of the misleading tongue taste map, which never made any sense and anyone with a tongue could tell was a whole lot of crap, but everyone bought into it anyway because humans vividly demonstrates how small, seemingly arbitrary decisions can have surprisingly long-lasting impacts. Because, and we cannot stress this enough, Humans, man. Grabthar can't get here sooner. These sugar caves aren't going to mine themselves. <laughs>